All right. <clears throat> so welcome, everyone. So this is Fall Gardening. Um, I am Dean Gunderson. I'm the Director of Education here at Seed St. Louis. Um, if you don't know Seed St. Louis, we um, you know, operate out of St. Louis. We work with about 250 different community gardens and orchards, um, and we support them in various ways. You should check out our website. Um, but we also teach all of these classes, which are geared toward um, kind of small scale growing in an urban environment and specifically St. Louis, because that's what we know, but a lot of the information is transferable to other areas if you're um, viewing us from somewhere else. Um, so first of all, just a little definition. So what, what am I actually talking about when I say fall gardening? Because sometimes people think of different things. So fall gardening, is, as, as we will be talking about it, is the gardening of cool season crops that you harvest in the fall or early winter. So cool season crops are things, basically all the stuff that you grew in the spring. So, um, you know, lettuce, spinach, carrots, beets, turnips, um, uh, broccoli, cauliflower, you know, all those kind of cool season things. Usually those kind of peter out or end whenever it gets hot in June. Um, so fall gardening is when you're planting them again to harvest them in the late fall or early winter. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. Um, there are also crops that you plant um, in late summer, like around now, to harvest in winter or even next spring. Um, we're not going to be talking about those specifically today. We'll be talking about those in our next class, which I have the date and everything for at the end here. Um, but a lot of the information is um, is similar. Like there's a lot of overlap between those two things. So if you're interested in that, check out our class. But also you should get information here that will help you with that as well. So um, briefly, what we're going to go over is we're going to go over a little bit of fall crop biology. So kind of what you need to know about what they need to grow. Um, and then we're just going to talk about, you know, what to plant in the fall, you know, what things are good to plant um, for a fall harvest here in the Midwest. Um, and then protection from heat, because you're going to be starting them when it's still hot. And then protection from frost, because usually you will be harvesting them um, in, in late fall, early winter, when we might be having um, some early frosts, which for some crops, um, they might not love, which we'll talk about what that looks like. So um, fall gardening is for the most part kind of a mirror of spring gardening. So again, you know, most of those things that you grew in the spring, um, you're going to be planting again in the fall with, with a couple exceptions. But fall gardening starts in the summer. Um, so oftentimes when people think about fall gardening, you know, they'll come to us in September and be like, oh, it's cool. Can I plant my fall garden? And it's way too late at that point, um, except for a few minor things that you could plant that late. Um, but although it seems counterintuitive, you really need to be planting your fall garden when it's still really pretty hot here. So I mean, around like in August, usually, or even late July, some people will plant some things, but really in August is what we're talking about. If you wait until you know September to be sticking seeds in the ground, for most things, you're not going to get a harvest before um, we get too cold, and also the days get too short. <clears throat> so, um, so those cool season vegetables that we're talking about um, grow in the spring and the fall. Um, so, spring is what most people think of when they're thinking about cool season vegetables. Um, but that, like, I've, like I've been saying, they also grow in the fall. And increasingly, there's a lot that will even grow into the winter as our winters have gotten um, warmer uh, over the last couple, couple years, especially the last decade. Um, and we'll go into those that do well over winter again in our next class. Um, some of these cool season plants will grow over the summer. So like if you had a kale or a collard or a Swiss chard plant, you plant it in the spring and you're like, well, it, you know, survived the, the summer. But generally, if they survive the summer, um, they're going to be growing pretty slowly when it's really hot. But if you have some of those still hanging around, um, as our temperatures get cooler and as we move into the fall, they're going to pick back up and start producing um, more again for you. So if you had any any of those cool season plants that are still kicking around in your garden, um, you might be able to just leave them and, and get in some, some better things um, as our temperatures cool down. 
and kind of the the distinguishing factor of cool season vegetables um, that that sets them apart from warm season vegetables is that they can tolerate frost. So your warm season vegetables, so things like tomatoes, peppers, eggplants, sweet potatoes, can't tolerate any frost at all. You get down to 32 degrees and they're going to start having severe damage or or dying. Um, cool season vegetables don't do that. You get a frost and it doesn't really bother them at all. Um, they do have varying levels of frost tolerance. So you know some things are fine down to zero degrees. Some things are only fine down to 28 degrees. Um, so there's there's varying levels of cold hardiness, um, but they can all tolerate frost, which is what sets them um, apart as a cool season vegetable. And so when we come to frost, like I just kind of alluded to, there's, um, there's different uh, kind of levels of frost. So down in the second part, there's you know types of frost. So a light frost is anything under 32 degrees, but not a whole lot colder. So generally a light frost is considered like 28 to 32 degrees. So that's usually what you're going to be seeing, um, you know, in in the uh, kind of mid mid to late fall, you know, where you might get, you know, a frost where, you know, it, it's a decent temperature during the day, but then it like just barely freezes and then comes back up the next day. So those are light frosts. Um, a hard frost is anything kind of below 28 degrees. Um, and then what you would call like a killing frost, which is gonna kill almost everything, um, that's anything below 10 degrees. There's really nothing that is gonna tolerate below 10 degrees um, for the most part. And this is um, just an example up here. So this down here is like a, a cabbage. So you can see it has like frost on it and that cabbage is fine. It's gonna be, you know, perfectly happy. Um, whereas this picture up here, you can see all this brown kind of damaged and this curling of the leaves and even this kind of purpling up here on the leaf. So these are sweet potatoes. So this was probably where it got to like 32 degrees at night for like an hour and it did that damage. So just there's, you know, varying levels of, of sensitivity. So, so sweet potatoes are, are decidedly a warm season crop. <clears throat> so then, you know, when to expect those those frosts. So when people say like the first frost date, that's based on like a statistical analysis of, you know, what are your chances of a frost happening? Um, so generally when people say the first frost date, that's the point at which on average throughout recorded history, there's a 50% chance that, a, that the temperatures would have dropped below freezing at least once by that date in a year. And so that 50% chance is uh, October 27th in St. Louis. Um, but as many of us know, it can often freeze before that. Because again, there's a 50% chance that it's going to happen before that. Um, and there's a 50% chance that it'll happen after that. So, you know, there's there's a 10% chance by October 10th. So, which which seems pretty early for, you know, for a lot of, in a lot of people's minds. Uh, but I think it was just maybe two years ago that we had our first frost on October 12th. Um, so it definitely happens earlier in October, and there's times that it happens really late, but there's a 90% chance that by Veterans Day, um, we'll, we'll have had at least one frost here in St. Louis. <clears throat> so then to kind of, you know, go back to this idea of like light frost versus hard frost. So um, your cool season vegetables that are only tolerant to a light frost. So, you know, that like, if the temperature stays above 28 degrees, they're going to be fine. So those are things like beets carrots, chard, um, and lettuce. So particularly with things like beets and carrots, the roots are gonna be okay below 28 degrees, um, but, the, but the, the leaves are gonna die. And so you're not gonna get any more growth um, on them into the fall if you get below that, that kind of temperature. So that's where the idea of kind of frost protection comes in is um, you might want you know, your beets or your carrots to grow a little bit longer, but it's gonna dip below 28 degrees one night. So you do a little bit of frost protection um, to keep them uh, growing for another you know, week or two until you get a hard frost or, or you know, something like that. But for light frost, it's things like beets, carrots, chard, um, and lettuce, and then um, turnips to some extent. Um, like the, 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 the root turnips are also a little bit more more sensitive, the, the greens on them. Um, turnip greens, like they're separate cultivar or varieties that are just for the greens, like, um, like seven top, those greens are much hardier than the root turnip greens. Um, so turnips kind of a kind of an in-between one. But then, oops, um, but then things that tolerate a hard frost um, in general, so things that are gonna be fine, but you know, below 28 degrees, usually like into the 20s or even into the teens. Um, 
are going to be a lot of your brassicas. So things like broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, collards, kale, kohlrabi. Um, mustard is, is pretty tough. Um, onions, particularly things, you know, like green onions. Um, you probably won't have any bulb onions in the ground in the fall. Um, but things like green onions or even like leeks are okay. Um, parsley, peas, radishes, um, spinach, um, arugula should be on this list as well. Um, as, as pretty cold tolerant. And this is just a picture over here of, of some kale and you can see it's, you know, it's pretty cold, it's at least below 32 um, with all this. And you can see the, the kale doesn't look like there's any, anything wrong at all. It just looks like kale hanging out. Another thing to consider though, oftentimes, you know, people think of, you know, it, it's the cold that kind of ends the gardening season. Um, and to some degree, so to some degree that's true, but, um, Oftentimes it's a, uh, it's the, 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 like here in St. Louis, the like real cold tends to come about when day length gets really short. Um, and so it's like, it's kind of hard to distinguish like which is which, but the sun is really the ultimate limiting factor. Um, if there is not enough light, it doesn't matter how hot it is. You know, you can have a, a greenhouse, you know, a heated greenhouse, that's great. Um, but if the day is too short, those plants in there, they won't die, but they're not gonna grow either. They're just gonna kind of hang out. Um, and generally speaking, just the shorter the days, the slower the plants growth is. So as you move into the fall, your plants are going to grow slower and slower and slower until eventually we get to what's called the Persephone days, um, at which point growth is going to almost completely stop. Um, and the Persephone days are the days of winter when we have less than 10 hours of sunlight. So when we get less, of 10 hour, less than 10 hours of sunlight, it's not only a short number of hours, but also it's when the sun is kind of lowest in the sky in terms of angle. So the sun that we're getting is also much less intense. And so the plants just aren't getting enough energy to photosynthesize enough to really be doing any real perceptible growth during that time. Uh, again, regardless of how warm it is or how warm you keep it. So in St. Louis, the, those Persephone days, so like when, the day length is less than 10 hours, um, runs from November 18th through January 23rd. So in that window, you're going to have virtually no growth and, and, you know, several weeks on either end, the growth is going to be very, very, very slow, even if you are getting growth. <clears throat> so um, because of that, because your um, you know, you're planting your fall crops kind of in the summer around now. And then as they grow, the days are getting shorter. It means that um, although as it gets cooler, they will grow a little a little faster um, than when it's really hot like this, the, the growth rate is gonna be kind of gradually slowing down as you progress through the fall gardening season. So again, really kind of the mirror of spring gardening where, you know, you plant in the spring garden when it's cold and the days are relatively short and they grow kind of slow. And then as you grow, they, they grow faster and faster. So it's, it's the opposite for fall gardening. So to kind of um, compensate for that, uh, you want to kind of add, um, add days to maturity, like of, of your expectation. So like this seed packet here, you know, says it's 65 to 75 days, um, like to harvest, like that's what that means. Well, that 65 to 75 days is a number based on spring gardening. Like that's always what those numbers are based on, on a seed packet. So a good um, kind of rule of thumb that we use is that if you're wanting to grow a crop for fall gardening, like if you're wanting to plant from seeds, you should probably add about 14 days to the days to maturity. So, you know, if you're looking at this like 65 to 75 days, if you're wanting to grow that in the fall, then you should probably expect it to take at least 90 days. So you're then going to want to figure out, you know, your average last frost date, like end of October, and then count back at least 90 days to figure out when you should really be planting that if you want to get a good crop um, before the days start getting too short, which is, you know, by the time you get to the end of October, growth is, hap is happening very slowly. So that's usually the number that I use is like end of October, and then I count back to figure out when, um, when to plant. We also have this nifty calendar that, again, if you're, if you're in St. Louis, um, is a calendar that we have made um, for, for growing in the St. Louis area based on our 
um, experience. So you can get this on our website if you don't have a, a physical copy. Um, it's on, I think it's on our homepage. So just seedstl.org. Um, and there's a little like key here at the bottom that you can you know, look to figure out what it is, but just a quick rundown. Um, for the fall, you'll see uh, either, you know, like a seed. So where there's a seed and then like hashed lines. So that tells you kind of when is the ideal time to be planting uh, fall crops from seed, like directly in the ground from seed. Um, these little shovels kind of show you when is the kind of ideal time to be moving your transplants outside if you were growing fall seedlings. Um, and then that will show you then this green is kind of when you can expect the harvest to be. So, um, you know, it's like, and you see these big long bars and we have that because it varies and, and even the planting window, it varies depending on like what variety you're doing. You know, if you have a really quick maturing radish, you could plant it much later than if you have a much longer days to maturity um, variety that you're trying to grow. So there is some flexibility here, but you can see in here that, you know, most of this planting is happening in, in August, which again is not what most people think about for fall gardening, but it's really when you need to get stuff either in the ground or starting to grow as a seedling to be getting them um, in the ground so that they have enough time to grow and mature before you get to that, that kind of end of October date where the days are getting way too short to really get much growth. <clears throat> so then I also always like to give this information, at least in my opinion and, and Seed St. Louis's opinion, um, the, the kind of the best ways to plant um, some of these things, or at least our preferred ways to do it, is if you're wanting to grow um, brassicas, so things like broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, collards, kale, kohlrabi, cauliflower, um, we really like to do those as seedlings. Like you really want to be planting a seedling into your garden as opposed to direct seeding seeds. The main reason that we recommend that is that those brassicas are very slow growing when they're when they're young. So starting them as a seedling can give you a serious head start um, on getting growth. And it also, um, like I, I will usually grow those seedlings like in an area, I usually do it outside, but I do it in an area outside where they're like in the shade in the afternoon. So it also helps keep them cooler um, during this really hot, hot time. And then I can move the, the seedlings out um, a little bit later so that they're a little bit more sheltered from the heat. Um, that being said, there are other things that we like to do from seeds. These are things that tend to grow um, more quickly or they just don't really like to be transplanted. So, you know, these are most of your root crops, so beets, carrots, um, and then just some faster growing greens, things like chard, dill, um, Mm, leeks, I'm not sure should be there. Um, <laughs> leeks, you should probably do a seedling if you can find seedling. Um, but then like lettuce, mustard, parsley, um, peas, radishes, spinach, and turnip are all things that usually we like to do from seeds for fall gardening. Um, parsley is another one that if you can find seedlings in the fall, um, do, do great um, from, from seedlings. But um, if you can't find seedlings, just throw the seed in the ground. Uh, so there are some things, like I said, it's, it's for the most part, you're planting a lot of the same things, but there are some things that do better in the spring than in, than in the fall. So uh, things like onions. So like green onions do great in the fall or like scallions or things like that. But if you're wanting to grow a bulbing onion, you know, like the big, you know, honking onions, uh, they, they, they just, they, do not work in the fall, or at least my understanding is they don't work. I've never met anyone who has made them work in the fall. So if you've done it, let me know. Um, but generally speaking, onions um, are day length sensitive. So what actually triggers that bulbing mechanism is um, when the days get over a certain length. Whereas when you're planting them in the fall, the, the days are moving in the wrong direction. So like you might get lots and lots of, of lush greenery on them, but you're not really gonna get a bulb because it's not getting that, um, that trigger uh, to, to shift its energy to producing a bulb. So again, the fall can be really good for, um, for green onions, scallions, things like that, but, um, but bulb onions, not gonna work. Um, peas are another one that are just hard to get pods in the fall. Um, they just tend to need a longer season than we usually have in the fall and more, 
more sun because they are, it's a, it's like a fruiting thing. So, you know, you, you can get lots of lush greenery on it, but usually by the time that they're kind of flowering and trying to produce pods, the day lengths are, are too short and you just don't get very many. Um, some people have done it, but it's, it's usually pretty hard to do. But I do always like to point out that the, the, the shoots of peas, like as they're growing, if you like break off kind of the last couple inches are edible and really good. Um, and they taste just like peas. Um, so you can grow them in the fall as kind of like a, a green crop, um, which, which I like to do. And peas are really hardy. So you can kind of keep kind of harvesting and eating those um, pretty late into the fall. Potatoes are another one um, that you, you can technically grow in the fall. They're usually, if you're gonna try and grow them in the fall, they're usually best as new potatoes just cause getting them to get nice big potatoes is hard. The main reason that we don't do potatoes in the fall is that finding seed potatoes in the fall is like virtually impossible. Um, so, so if you have potatoes, you can throw them in the ground and try them. Um, but that's another one where again, you need to be planting them pretty early to get enough time uh, to actually uh, mature any potatoes for you. But there's also some things that do better in the fall than in the spring. So um, if you like heading brassicas, so things like cabbage, um, but especially broccoli and cauliflower, fall is by far the best time to grow those in St. Louis. Um, because we're going from hot to cooler, um, they, they just, they usually like that a lot better in the spring where it's cool when it's leafy, but when it's trying to form its head, is, it's really hot, is, um, is really hard on them. And that's what will cause like the open, um, like broccoli heads or the like loose cauliflower heads and kind of the bitter flavor um, and the off colors. A lot of that comes from that heat that we get in late spring, early summer. But in the fall, broccoli and cauliflower do much better and, and Brussels sprouts as well. If you're wanting to do Brussels sprouts in St. Louis, you should really do it as a fall crop. Um, the, the problem with Brussels sprouts that makes them even harder is you probably should have started those as seeds in June. Like they just need a really, really long season. Um, so you might have needed to, so maybe, maybe think about that for next year. Or if you can find some nice big seedlings, you could try that this year in the fall. But for heading brassicas, especially broccoli, cauliflower, and Brussels sprouts, they do much better in the fall um, in general than in the spring. Uh, I also seem to like the fall for really like heat sensitive greens, things that bolt um, pretty early, like or like when the temperatures are, are hot, but not like extremely hot. So especially things like arugula, spinach, um, or even cilantro, I find um, do really well in the fall here. Um, and you can get a longer harvest from them in the fall than oftentimes you can in the spring. There's also fall, so fall is one of my favorite, like fall and winter are like my, my favorite vegetable gardening seasons. Um, and one of the reasons is these great varieties that are called winter varieties. So, um, which are ones that you plant in the fall, which is confusing. Um, but these winter varieties are varieties of cool season crops that have been bred specifically to be grown in the fall and have a long storage life. So these are things that, you know, our ancestors were growing to like put in the root cellar or like to store for winter um, so that they had vegetables kind of throughout the cold parts of winter. So for beets, um, there's a variety called Lutz green leaf. Um, so it does, it does pretty well. Um, the beet gets much larger. So, so oftentimes these winter varieties, they're, they're bigger, which helps them kind of hold moisture for longer. There's like a, a bigger, you know, volume to surface area or a smaller volume to surface area ratio. I don't, I don't know how that works, but there's less surface area for how much volume there is as a ratio, um, than like smaller things. Um, they do also tend to need a longer season than than other varieties. You know, like a, a, a winter beet is gonna take probably a month longer than just like a, your standard beet um, because they, they get a lot bigger. So again, these are things that you're gonna be planting um, earlier than you would think you would need to um, to get a good fall harvest. Radishes, winter radishes, I think are one of the most undervalued um, vegetable crops in our area. Um, so these again are radishes that as far as I know, pretty much all of them, um, other than maybe Spanish black, um, but pretty much all of them have come out of, of East Asia, um, where they grow much bigger 
um, radishes. It's not the little, the little tiny red ping pong ball size radishes, um, but they're like big honking radishes. And so again, they need a much longer growing season than like those little tiny red ping pong balls that we commonly grow here. Um, my favorite winter radish is Chinese white. So it's called Chinese white winter radish. Um, it's the one that I found to be kind of the most, um, the most rugged here, like kind of the most dependable, like every year it'll produce pretty well. Um, Chinese rose winter radish is pretty similar to Chinese white. Um, I, I find it doesn't tend to grow as quickly. So you tend to get smaller radishes, but it does have a nice pink color to it, um, which is pretty and good to have um, some diversity in your diet, whereas the, the Chinese white is just white all the way through. Um, Spanish black has like a real thick, like almost like scaly looking skin on it, um, which helps it store for a long time. Um, the, in, the interior is white and I have not had real great luck with Spanish black. Um, it, it does grow well, but definitely the Chinese white and Chinese rose do better in my experience. And then daikons. Um, so there's lots of different types of daikons and they can get enormous, like huge, like two feet long, crazy um, things. And they're also, again, good. Um, they store pretty well. And for these, like the Chinese white and the Chinese rose are the ones that I grow the most. Um, you know, like the storage, again, like to give you an example, um, you know, like the little red ping pong balls, you know, if you've grown those, you know, they just, they don't store very long. Like they don't just, la they don't last very long after you harvest them. Whereas, you know, the Chinese white and the Chinese rose, I just like stick in a grocery bag and I'll stick in the crisper drawer and, and I eat them. And, I mean, like generally I'll still be eating them in like February, early March. And they're still pretty good um, hanging out in the fridge. Uh, so I, I really like winter radishes. I definitely recommend them. Uh, cabbage is another one that just generally does great. Oh, I got duplicates there. Yeah, so cabbage, um, I mean, really all cabbages are great. Uh, but there are ones that were bred um, to, to be more frost tolerant. Um, so they, so they grow a little bit longer um, and they, and they just, they store longer. So they're better for fall than for a spring planting because of their, their storage ability. So these would be things like January King, uh, Winter King Savoy, Ormskirk and Dead On Savoy um, are all, are all good ones that we've grown in the fall. And then kohlrabi, there's winter kohlrabi, which are kohlrabi that get enormous, but still stay tender. Um, so most kohlrabi, if you've grown kohlrabi before, you know, you usually get them about that big. And if you let them get much bigger than that, like, cause they'll grow bigger than that, they tend to get real woody and not very good on the inside. Um, doesn't always happen, but oftentimes that's what happens. Um, whereas the winter kohlrabi will get like big, like softball size or even bigger um, and still stay tender um, on the inside. Uh, and again, they do, they, they store, um, much longer than those, those smaller ones, just because of, of how they were bred. So those are things like, um, uh, I don't know how you correctly pronounce that, uh, gigant, that, that's, that's the correct spelling, um, gigant, I guess, winter, um, super schmelz or Cossack are all, um, good ones. And I think the first two, the, the gigant winter and super schmelz, I believe those are like open pollinated, um, ones, which is, uncommon for brassicas. Most brassicas are hybrids. And I know Cossack is a hybrid, um, but Gigant Winter and Super Schmelz um, and then um, the radishes and Lutz, Lutz Greenleaf, I know are all, all open pollinated if you're interested in, in saving your own seed. I've saved um, winter radish seeds quite a few years. And usually to do that, I plant them in the spring so that they bolt because in the fall, they don't, they don't bolt. <laughs> so if you want to save seed, you should plant a couple in the spring and they'll produce great seed for you. Because winter radish can be relatively hard to get seed. It's not a real common seed to find. Um, but all of these are, are good ones that, that really you don't want to grow in the spring if you're looking to harvest like the vegetable. Um, but they do really good in the fall. <clears throat> so then if you're planting these things as seedlings or as seed, um, like I keep saying, you know, you're planting these in August. Um, you know, I imagine we've all been outside at least once in the last you know, a couple weeks and it's pretty miserable still. Um, it's not what you think about when you think about cool season things. So if you're wanting to start some of these cool season crops outside, um, a lot of them will really appreciate um, keeping them cooler. And there's a couple different ways um, to do that. So um, you can use uh, plenty of water is really helpful. Mulch is really helpful. And then 
actually doing things to provide like literal shade um, to the plants. And I'm gonna talk about the ways to do that in the next couple of slides. Um, but, but the shade in particular, um, but also the mulch and providing plenty of water helps to keep the soil cool as well as like the air temperature, um, which can really help speed germination. Because a lot of these plants, you know, oftentimes we think about, oh, plants need the soil to be at least a certain temperature. Like, it, like usually we think about um, soil temperatures as it needs to be at least this hot, but there's also too hot especially for these cool season crops, where if the, if the soil temperature is too high, they won't germinate either. And so doing things to keep the soil cooler can also help them to, to germinate more quickly. And especially that early growth when they're most fragile and tender um, to, get, to get that early growth going um, more quickly. So uh, the first thing and you know, very important thing that, that hopefully you're doing anyways, is just providing plenty of water. So um, these cool season plants, you know, are not, they're not adapted to heat. That's not what they're, what they're designed for. And so um, uh, you want to make sure that they have plenty of water because um, a lack of water causes stress in all plants. Even if they're adapted to heat, they're going to be more stressed and the, and the high heat is going to do more damage to the plant um, if, if they don't have enough water. So um, if you are planting your cool season things, you wanna make sure that you are watering them regularly, it, like when it's hot. Uh, when the temperatures break, you know, you can back off a little bit, um, but you wanna make sure that that soil is staying, is staying moist. And, um, you know, you just kind of stick your finger in the soil, see if it feels wet or not. And if it doesn't, water it. If it does still feel wet, then maybe wait, you know, another day. Um, but you don't want to be letting that soil dry out fully and get hot. Um, the plants are just not going to like that and they might just die. <clears throat> um, and watering your soil can, can actually cool, um, cool the soil temperature down as well. Because I mean, one, water tends to be cold when it's coming out of a hose, um, but also like the evaporation of the water that's going to be happening from the soil um, when there's water there after you water um, actually is, it, is a cooling mechanism. It's going to lower the temperature of that soil. So make sure to water your plants if you're trying to get your fall garden established. Mulch is also really helpful. I think mulch is, is helpful all year long, but especially if you're wanting to do a fall garden, um, mulch can be a very, very big asset for you because mulch uh, can help in two ways. So mulch conserves moisture, which helps again to keep that soil moist, which is going to reduce stress on those plants and going to help speed up germination um, if, if the soil is wet. Uh, and then mulch also helps keep soil cooler because it's literally shading the soil. Like when the sun is, is you know, hitting soil directly. It's directly warming up that soil and it's like radiating that heat down into the soil, raising the soil temperature. Whereas if you have mulch, which is usually like a fluffy material, it's essentially insulation. And the heat, like the radiant heat is hitting that mulch, but it's not really radiating it down very quickly into the soil. So there was a study that was done, um, and this isn't even like a great mulch or a great amount of mulch, but they were comparing like no-till corn and soybeans versus um, a, a tilled field. So the tilled field has no plant residue at all, whereas um, the no-till does have, have plant residue on top, but it's not like you should have more mulch than is on a cornfield. Um, but even with that difference, there was an eight to 10 degree Fahrenheit temperature difference. Like the, the tilled field that was bare soil was 10 degrees hotter than the one that, that was not tilled. So having that mulch material can really help lower um, your soil temperatures. Um, and, and when I say mulch, any plant material can be a mulch. Um, my favorites are straw, like if you can get a straw bale or leaves. Um, what I use probably the most of is weeds <laughs> uh, because I have plenty of weeds. Like when you, you know, rip weeds out, kind of let them, especially this time of year, like you weed them, you throw them off to the side. Usually by the time you're done weeding, those plants are like dried and shriveled up from the heat. And then I just throw the weeds back on the bed as mulch. It works great. But if you have access to like dead leaves, like leaves that you raked up from your yard or straw, straw and leaves are really great. Um, 
leaves from your trees, I think are like one of the most valuable things that people throw away all the time. It's crazy. If you have a vegetable garden, you should be saving those leaves and using them as mulch all year long. They are like the best mulch in my opinion. And then providing shade. So this is so this is a tool that can have a huge impact, but but does take a little bit more work. Um, not everybody's going to do this. I don't usually do this, um, but uh, it can be really really helpful. Um, and if you're really wanting to get your stuff off to a start, I would recommend shade. I recommend to myself to do it every year. I just never get around to it. Um, but in and and it works because you know oftentimes you think about like well if it's like shade then the plants aren't getting enough sun and like and you know we say in our class all the time like vegetables need like full sun and that's true but in the summer um, the intensity of the sun you're like per square foot you're getting way more energy in the summer than you are in the fall because of the angle of the sun so um, it needs full sun like it needs to be you know you don't want it like behind a wall or something. But if you make the shade, like if you put something over to block a percentage of the of the sun, like if you put a screen over it or something like that, um, you're still going to get more than enough sun to do all the photosynthesis that is needed. But it's also going to keep the temperature a little lower. So that's what we're talking about here. We're not talking about you know putting you know a solid thing over to block the sun completely. We're talking about creating like a dappled sun environment to cut the amount of heat that the plant is getting because it's getting more than enough like light intensity like photons from the sun. It's getting more than enough um, in these hot days of summer. And because of that providing shade to plants can actually boost growth um, because you're keeping it cooler which creates less stress but it's still getting all the sun that it needs. And when we're talking about our cool season things, I mean, we're talking, we can provide 40 to, like we can block 40 to 60% of the sun and the plants will still grow just fine in this summertime. So this is a picture of like a big setup that somebody did where it's almost like a high tunnel, but it's got uh, like mesh material over the top to provide shade. So you're probably not gonna do that, but um, you could do like a smaller thing, like a low tunnel. And these are some of the covers um, that we would recommend. So something like row cover can be a nice multi-purpose thing to use in the fall because it can act to provide shade when it's hot. Um, if you leave kind of the sides up, like if you drape it just over the top of a structure so that you still get lots of airflow. And then um, when it starts getting cool, if you close it, like in this picture, it's also gonna keep your plants a little warmer. So it's a good kind of multi-purpose thing. Um, but if you're looking at just blocking sun, like just providing shade, uh, there are materials made specifically for that called shade cloth. Um, and they can have a huge um, temperature benefit for you. So there was one person that I was reading, like a, like a study that he did, where he got as much as a 30 degree reduction in temperature, like air temperature around the plants by using shade cloth, most companies will say to expect about a 10 to 15% reduction um, kind of on average. But that's, I mean, that's pretty significant. You know, 10 to 15 degree temperature difference can be, can be a, a big benefit um, for these cool season plants to keep them growing. If you're looking to buy shade cloth, I would recommend buying light colors um, because like, as in like the, the fabric itself is often sold as a black mesh. Um, like in this last picture that I had, except I can't go back. Um, so in that last picture that I had, like it was black, that's the most common color you'll see. But if you get a, a lighter color, like a white or a gray, um, they, they let more light through while still keeping the temperature lower, which um, can be helpful, especially as we get kind of later into summer and into fall when the sun's intensity um, starts dropping, but the temperatures might still be high, especially like September around here can be still pretty hot, even though the sun intensity is going down. So uh, black fabric reduces PAR, which is a measure of like how much light plants can use by 47 to 54%, while kind of the same weave of a white, red, or gray material only reduced it by like, you know, 30 to 40%. Um, so those lighter colors, if you're looking to buy a shade cloth, um, buy a lighter color. It's, it's, it's better. Um, and then we sell um, uh, this, um, it, so it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a net or a mat that is made um, actually to control erosion, uh, but it's made out of ute or core, um, which are um, biodegradable, 
which we like, whereas the, the shade cloth is made out of plastic, but you can get this and it looks and it looks like this. Um, and this will this works pretty well as like a shade cloth as well if you're looking to not have as much plastic in your life. Um, and, it, and it will still last for, for several years. Like if you're, you know, you're just using it for a part of the year, if you leave it out there all year, it'll break down more quickly, but um, it'll last quite a while if it's just up for you know, a couple months in the fall. Uh, and another way, definitely the, the cheapest way to provide shade is to plant your fall crops in the shade of your already growing summer crops. Um, so, you know, your summer crops that are already there um, are usually pretty tall. So, you know, like usually tomatoes get pretty tall. If you're trellising squash or melons or things like that, you know, they're usually going up or pole beans that you're trellising that are going up. So planting your cool season things um, in the shade of those summer crops can be a way um, to kind of utilize your space a little better and, um, and get that cooling benefit. So this uh, picture here is in our, our demo garden where we have this trellis that we built up to go at an angle. So it's got squash on it. Um, and this is angled toward the west. So it's casting shade in the afternoon, but in the early morning, this is full of sun. And then kind of around midday, it starts casting shade, which is when it gets really hot. So we get the squash that we're able to grow all summer and fall. And then we can start our cool season um, crops under here to get them started a little earlier. So you can do something like that, or even like if you've got sweet corn planted, you can plant, um, you know, lettuce or spinach kind of around them. So they're, they're getting some shade. And it's a great way to kind of, uh, again, to, to maximize the use of your space and, uh, and give those, those cool season plants a little, a little break from the heat. But on the other end of the season, you're also going to want to protect your plants from frost. Maybe, sometimes you don't need to. But um, sometimes you might be in a situation where you'll have some, some early frosts where, you know, you know, like I said, I think it was, I think it was last year that we had a frost uh, like October 12th and it wasn't like real cold, but I think like it was cold enough that we got some damage even on like some of those light frost things. Um, and so if we had offered a little bit of protection to that, then those, um, then those things that are only tolerant to light frost wouldn't have been damaged at all. And we didn't have another frost for like three weeks. And so they would have grown for like a whole nother three weeks uh, without any damage if we had just offered them a little bit of, of protection. Um, or if we get a really cold frost, like a really hard frost early, you know, providing this can help keep your, um, your cool season things going just a little bit longer into the fall. <clears throat> there, there's, you know, so fabric, low tunnels, and cold frames are kind of the main ways um, that we talk about uh, protecting things from, from frost, like when you're talking about fall gardening, and not when you're trying to keep stuff warm kind of all winter long, but just like protecting from a couple um, late frosts. And this can also be, you know, useful for, for your summer crops too, you know, so like we had tomatoes that got roasted by that frost that was like October 12th. And then again, it didn't really get cold for like another two or three weeks. So if we had protected them for that one night, we could have had another three weeks of tomatoes potentially. Um, so fabric is, is kind of the lowest tech, easiest, cheapest way to do that. So that's just where like in this picture, this is like a bush, but like just a blanket, a sheet, something you just throw over the plant, which I think, yeah, put here. Um, or old towels, old towels work really well. You just kind of drape it over the plant. You can build like a low tunnel structure and then put the fabric over it. Um, but usually if you're gonna do like a low tunnel structure, people are doing like row cover or something that's specifically made for that. I haven't seen many people that will do a low tunnel and put a sheet over it, um, although I guess you could. <clears throat> but a low tunnel is just, a, it's a small greenhouse essentially. So this picture over here kind of shows one where you just make, you make hoops. Um, Again, usually not very tall. I guess you can't see me there, but you know, maybe two, three feet tall, um, not real big. Uh, and we usually do that either out of wire. Um, so just like a, a stiff wire that you can kind of bend. Um, you can also buy like pre-bent ones that already come in a nice, perfect little half circle. You can find those online or we also sell them. Um, you can also use like a thin PVC pipe, like a, like a half inch PVC pipe that you can get. Um, and they bend just fine into that nice shape for you. Or if you want to like, if you have like a pipe bender, you can buy um, metal conduit, like metal electrical conduit and bend a hoop that's going to last you for a long time. And then you would cover that low tunnel usually with row cover, 
which is um, that thin um, kind of material. It looks almost like a dryer sheet is what it looks like, but it comes in like big rolls so you can cover a big long area. Um, and again, we, we sell that by the foot. You can also find it online. I don't know of any local suppliers um, other, than, other than us. Um, you could also cover it with, um, with plastic. Um, but if you're just looking to protect from some early frosts, like for fall gardening, row cover would probably be better. Plastic is usually um, more effective if you're wanting to keep stuff um, warm all winter, because in the, in the fall, when we can still have pretty intense sun, but cold nights, the plastic can heat up too much during the day and actually burn your plants. Um, so usually if you're just talking about like fall gardening, row cover is what I would recommend if you're doing a low tunnel um, or, you know, just covering with some old sheets or towels or blankets or something like that. And then cold frames um, is the other thing that you can do. So these are, you know, more expensive, a little bit fancier, but they, they look a little nicer maybe. Um, so there's lots of different ways to make them um, kind of out of wood. Um, boards and then with uh, you know either like an old window or a piece of plexiglass or something like that over the top is the most common but you can also like rig something together with like some straw bales and then throw some sheet plastic on the top like it doesn't need to be like a true cold frame you can just kind of rig something up where it's like a insulated walls and then like a, a clear material on top to collect some heat um, and again these are best for like season extension like what we're talking about like for you know, if you're just trying to get through a couple um, early frosts, more so than it is to like keep stuff alive all winter in our climate, but it can work. The, the main thing uh, that you need to know about cold frames that oftentimes doesn't get discussed um, is in our climate, especially, they need to be vented because, you know, if you have this window and it's just down and we have a day where, oh, it was below freezing last night. And so you wanted it to be a little warmer. Um, well, then if the next day, if it's up in the 50s and sunny, which is pretty common, it's going to be like 90 degrees in here and you're going to roast a lot of your plants. And so there, you really need to have some sort of ventilation, whether that's just in the morning, you go out and you open it, <laughs> it like once the temperatures warm up and then kind of in the, in the evening, you close it or something. Um, but you're going to need something on those like bright, sunny days when the temperature gets above freezing that you're going to want to have a way to to open that and to remember to do that there are some like automatic things that you can get there's these things called um well they're vent arm greenhouse vent arms but there's ones that come with these um wax cylinders they call it where the heat of like being in there when the temperature gets above like 85 the wax will melt and as it melts it expands and it will push the arm open so the hotter it gets, the more open that like that window will get. And so it'll vent more. And then as it cools down in the late afternoon and the evening, the wax will resolidify and it will like automatically close it for you. So those are really nice. Um, if you can get them, but they do, I mean, they're not real expensive, but they do cost a couple bucks. Um, and again, I don't know of a local supplier of those. You'd have to order those um, online, but you definitely are going to want to be aware that ventilation is something that is needed if you're going to do a cold frame. And so that is the basics of fall gardening. It's it's really not that complicated because it's again it's 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 spring gardening. It's all kind of the same crops except for um, you know there's some variety differences like we talked about for those like winter winter beets and winter radishes and things like that. Um, but uh, but yeah, it's a lot of the same a lot of the same stuff. Um, and just be aware that you need to take care of those plants through this heat um, so that they are nice and healthy so that as the temperatures cool, they can continue to grow and you can harvest some really good vegetables. And I will also mention the other benefit of fall vegetable gardening is they tend to taste better because especially if they go through a couple frosts, a lot of the like starches and stuff will break down into sugars. So like carrots, like fall carrots are so much sweeter than spring grown carrots um, and even like kale and stuff like after it's been like frosted a couple times like it, they're just like sweeter they taste better fall vegetables are the best um, that being said if you're interested in winter gardening or overwintering crops so things that you plant um, now or in the next couple months 
to harvest in winter or even into next spring, um, which is which is totally doable here. Um, we are going to have that class in a couple weeks on August 18th. Um, same time, it'll still be Zoom. So check that one out if you are interested. Um, and then this is just a, a shout out because there's people on here. Uh, we are also working on a class um, on kind of garden reuse. So kind of uh, uh, how to use things in the garden that maybe weren't designed for the garden, like, you know, using an old kiddie pool as a pot or, you know, or something like that. Um, so we're kind of working on a class for that. And so if anyone has any like favorite garden reuse or like waste reduction things that they do in the garden, uh, shoot me an email. I would love to hear those uh, those ideas and it might make it into our class, which hopefully we'll be teaching this fall sometime. Uh, but it's still unclear how long it's going to take us to get to get all that together. So um, ready for thank some questions. you all. And yes, I'm going to stop the recording.